the more I in, invested myself in these issues, does they say in the Red Pill movie, the further down the rabbit hole I went and saw the pain of men as a clinician in ways that embarrassed me that I had never seen before. I was disgusted with myself that of all the million questions I had never asked into their lives. And so my work became a redemption for that. And like Mike, I'll do it until the day I stop breathing. Thank you. See, that's brotherly love. All right, introducing my panelists. I'm not going to do a big preamble. I have already insulted all of them except for Mike. Oh, no, I haven't insulted Robert yet either. Uh, Robert is a lawyer, so you automatically know he's an asshole. Um, and uh, Mike Buchanan, uh, what can I say about Mike Buchanan? He, he's a truly evil person. And, uh, and I think that you should, uh, you should all probably hurl abuse at him when it comes to be question time. Okay, so getting started, because we are late. Um, I want uh, all of you guys to give your perspective on how you got started in this and how you became, how you, how you actually, because we're talking about how to build the men's, or build the building of the men's rights movement, and you all played a key role in that. So I want you to, uh, one at a time, let's start with Robert. We are on. Okay, well, one thing to remember about, pardon me, uh, trying to build this movement is uh, one fundamental thing, and that is we're right. <laughs> and you shouldn't forget that because we do get balled up in the minutia of fighting this fight, and that's understandable. But we are right. We do have fairness and justice on our side. We have social science. We have neuroscience on our side. Arrayed against that is gynocentrism, a long tradition of uh, valuing and privileging women over men. And so that's what's in, in uh, dynamic conflict. Um, and and uh, that's that's the you know that's the enemy is is the gynocentric narrative, and it's a bear. But we do have right on our side, and and uh, so the core of this movement is getting the facts out into the public arena, because the public will respond if they know the truth. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to say that the, um, I think the um, work done by MRAs online, uh, particularly in, maybe in the last five or six years, has been absolutely astonishing. I think we, you know, online, we, 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 we're killing feminism, um, or at least, you know, raising public awareness. But that is still a very, the, men, the men's issues bubble is still a, still a very small one. And it's, it's very difficult if you spend your life in it, as I do, to kind of realize that... Um, the stuff we're saying would, seems crazy to, to, to the stranger in the street, and it's one of the reasons I go to Speaker's Corner every two weeks, um, it, you know, to, to kind of ground myself in, in how little the, you know, the, the general public knows. Uh, but the thing the men's rights movement needs to do is for, is, is, is for people to get away from their damned keyboards and start on some street campaigning, start on some practical activism. You know, we, we, at Speaker's Corner, it's always the same four or five guys, you know? We, we, we protest outside the Conservative Party conference every year. It's the same four or five guys. Why is it not 40, 400, 4,000? That's when people will, you know, are going to take some notice, I think. And it just baffles me. People will fly from the opposite part of the world to an ICMI, and they won't do so much as handing out leaflets in the street back home. It, it, it's, it just baffles me. That's, you know, we, we, we need people in this room, if you're not already engaged in some practical and street activism to start doing it as soon as you get back home.
Hey you! Yes you! Watching this video! Did you miss out on going to the International Conference on Men's Issues? Or did you go and now you miss the fun times you had at this amazing event? Experience the magic of ICMI 2019 again or for the very first time with Honey Badger Radio's ICMI Disc Set. The Disc Set brings ICMI presentations together in one convenient package as well as Disc Set exclusive Badger bonus content. Enjoy behind the scenes Badger interviews with free speech and men's issues luminaries like Sargon, Janice Fiamengo, and Count Dankula, as well as a never before seen Badger cartoon. Also available is sparkling ICMI merch, such as our professionally designed program book, sticker sets, badges, and more. Go to feedthebadger.com and claim a piece of men's rights history for yourself. Here, here. I'm Paul Elam, founder of A Voice for Men, and the idiot that started this conference series. <laughs> um, I want to pick up on what Mike was talking about. I mean, there's a lot we can say about activism, and, and it's easy to overlook the fact that, in fact, over the past five to ten years, we have changed a lot in the narrative out there about these issues. People are at least online, speaking up. And we now, we, we finally have the inklings of some politicians starting to address these issues. And some companies like Eckerd Watches uh, responding to come. Yes, they deserve applause big time. Uh, responding to the sickness that's being peddled by companies like Gillette in order to make a buck. I heard they lost eight billion and every last dollar looks good on them as far as I'm concerned. But what Mike said is absolutely right. You know, I, my email box stays full of people interested in these issues. And I get emails that run along the same lines all the time. Hey Paul, here's this news story. Why don't you talk about it on YouTube? Don't mention my name. And that gives me a chuckle sometimes, and sometimes i got to be honest, I'm really sick of that shit. Um, we have a problem in this culture. We can sit here and we can complain about feminism, we can complain about gynocentrism all we want, and the fact of the matter is that 99.999% of men in this culture will sit there and take it silently and even fund it. It's a disgrace on us. Uh, people do, and I'm, I'm not trying to set myself or anybody else up as a martyr, but you know, there's a price to pay for doing this. They come after you. They come after you hard. And every once in a while, I have to stop and wonder, why do we do this for a population of men that'll stick a shank in our back? And so I think at some point, we need to engage in some healthy shaming. We need to challenge men to get off their butts, to stop being silent, that when they come out of family court robbed and raped and ridiculed, to not say, oh, I'm just glad it's over. I don't want to revisit that stuff anymore, but to, to fight, to join the fight and start swinging. We can't sit here and laud these great women, like the women that put on this conference, we can't sit there and talk about how great they are because what we're saying is, please fight for us. Do it for us. Um, so excuse me if I'm a little emotional about this. This is a subject near and dear to my heart. Um, we have got to quit expecting others to stand up for our rights. Uh, if we can't get men to stand up, we're screwed. That's the bottom line. Um, and in saying all that, I want to thank all the men and women in this conference right now for being a part of changing that. You're valuable and you're important. Thank you. I'm no longer sure of, of what I'm supposed to talk about because I, I, I thought it was how we got started. So, Do that. Because um, that's what I am. 
I ne a, a lot of people went through a feminist phase and then got turned off by it. I, n I, n I skipped that. I never, right from the start, um, I knew that feminism was wrong because it was telling me about my experience and it was wrong. You know, it was telling me how powerful I feel and I didn't feel powerful. It was telling me how free I was. And um, I, I was, you know, these were, these were women who were complaining that um, they were being pressured to get married and have children. And I, I wasn't pressured to get married and have children. I could do anything I want. And this was at the exact same time that the government was telling me that I either had to go to Vietnam and kill people or get killed um, or leave the country or go to jail. You know, I, I, I didn't see my options as, wow, I could do anything I want. I saw my options as far more limited than theirs. And um, so I, n I never really got into that. And um, I realized when I went to a conference on men and masculinity back in the 70s that um, people were just not thinking about these things, you know, because that, that had the top people in the field and I kept talking to them about the agenda of, you know, the, what we've been talking about for the last three days and they kept saying, I never thought of that before. So that's how I got involved. Um, I th the, the flaws that, I, the, the ba I, I taught, as far as I know, the first uh, university level course on, on men's rights and men's issues. And what I did, I, I started the first day by saying that women have all the power and men have all the problems and I defied them to come up with any phenomenon, any statistic, anything they noticed that did not fit in with my model. And they couldn't, and this was a, a top university. They couldn't because men and women are interdependent and anything that they identified as a woman's problem, I could twist around and point out how it hurts men. No, it's really a men's problem. And that's what feminism does. You can't really poke holes in its logic because it's possible to interpret every men's problem as a woman's problem. Um, if you look at life expectancy, for example, and, and you Google it and you, know, you read all the articles that talk about low male life expectancy as a gender issue, nine out of 10 of the articles will be framing it as a woman's issue, that the poverty rate for, wi for widows, the, um, the loneliness of widows, you know, that this creates problems. When a man dies, women don't get to celebrate, women have a problem. So we don't even get to die and have credit for having a problem. Um, I think that's the, the most important thing, like the weakness, the central weakness in feminism is to talk to people about how men and women are really interdependent and not competitors. Because most people know that deep down inside. And once you get that, then you can start pointing these things out because right now people think, well, women have so many problems, you know, like why should we spend attention on this? Women just have so many problems. And this, this is the way to undercut that is, is um, to talk, about, and, and people also don't like the anger that's generated between men and women. That, that's an inevitable result of feminism because feminism teaches resentment and anger and blame towards men. Um, people, I think, want to get away from that. And the key to that is talking about the interdependence of men and women so that we're in this together. There's no reason to be angry. Um, we acknowledge women's ha women have problems and we as men want to solve those problems because they come back and hurt us. But you need to help us stop celebrating, <laughs> which, which is what a lot of feminists do when, you know, when I'm debating them. And, and they'll deny that, a man, that men have problems. And when I finally get them to admit it, they'll go, well, good, it's about time you had a problem, instead of recognizing that it hurts them, too. OK, so uh, I want origin stories now, gentlemen. So I know we just got yours. Did we get yours as well? No? Um, and so everybody, origin stories. But don't be too, too long, because uh, we got about 10, 12 minutes, maybe 15, and then we got to do a Q&A. Well, my origin story uh, came, about, came about very uh, 
totally by accident. Um, I had a friend. I was an attorney practicing law in Houston. One of my attorney friends got a call in his law office that went something like this. Hey, Greg, remember me? Well, uh, <clears throat> it's been a long time. Well, your son wants to talk to you. He's 21 years old. The woman and my friend Greg had had an affair 22 years previously, something like that. She had broken it off, and they had gone their separate ways. Unbeknownst to him, she had had his child. And it was an, he was white, she was black, and the young man started looking at himself and looking at his mother and saying, okay, who is my father? And when he was 21, he said, you want to give me a birthday present? You let me talk to my dad. And so that's what happened. Uh, this uh, opened quite a panorama for me. It, uh, the, uh, I, my, I'm a lawyer. I, my attitude is find somebody to sue. He's got parental rights. I knew that much. She had denied them. He's obviously got a cause of action against her. Wrong. No. She had committed no legal wrong. Um, and anyway, so I started uh, uh, investigating that, studying the law, and the more I learned, the farther my jaw dropped. Uh, and that's how I got into father's rights, principally, and from there it's not a long step to, to men's rights. Um, in 2006 to 8, um, I was a business consultant for the Conservative Party in the UK. Um, and in 2009, David Cameron, um, I, should, sorry, I should say the party was then in opposition. Um, and they, um, in 2005, the party had a new leader, a guy called David Cameron, who, um, it's not only Canada that has mangina prime ministers, <laughs> shall I say. Um, he was, he was uh, you know, he, he, he doesn't have a conservative bone in his body. Um, but in 2009, he, he, he declared that he wanted to introduce all women shortlists for prospective parliamentary candidates. Um, and um, that, that kind of, the more I looked into that, the, the more outraged I was about it. And I, I actually cancelled my party membership that day, and, a, and a, I was told quite a considerable number of party members did, did likewise. And that just kind of started me on the journey. And within about 12 months of that, I decided to devote the rest of my life to fighting this evil scourge of feminism. And I shall do it as long as my health, you know, is good enough to do it. God willing, that's a long time, Mike. Um, uh, for those of you who have heard my story before, I apologize for the repetition, but I'll try to make it brief and painless. In 1993, when I was the clinical program director for a residential substance abuse treatment facility, I stumbled on a book called The Myth of Male Power. And I read it in three nearly sleepless nights <laughs> a couple of times, and I felt like my life was changed. And I started noticing immediately a whole world of things that I had never seen before. Things that had been right in front of my face, this close, blaring like neon signs, and uh, just was blind to them. And one of those things was how we treated men and women differently in the res in a clinical treatment setting. How we literally viewed women all as victims and men as perpetrators. Even People that were coming from mental health services were being berated for their sex. It's amazing. And when I pointed out the ways that that was happening at the facility I worked at, my peers went ape shit. Oh my God, oh my God. I didn't mean they ran around like their hair was on fire. 
just because I said something obviously true. And I thought, cool. <laughs> wow, that fits me to a T. Uh, unfortunately, at the time, I thought about it at the time, the internet wasn't really a thing. I said about a campaign of writing letters to editors, and sometimes they got published, sometimes not, mostly not. And eventually, I, we had an internet that was reaching a lot of people. And I thought, man, if I could make my peers lose their shit just in that one small little setting, imagine what I can do with a tool like this. <laughs> and I said, well, I really, it's not like I want to make money at this. And so far, that's working out real good. Uh, <laughs> but I really wanted, and the more I did this, the more I learned, because there was even more to learn than what was in Warren's book, even though it's a, it's a huge volume of information. There was a lot more to learn. The more I in, invested myself in these issues, does they say in the Red Pill movie, the further down the rabbit hole I went and saw the pain of men as a clinician in ways that embarrassed me that I had never seen before. I was disgusted with myself that of all the million questions I had never asked into their lives. And so my work became a redemption for that. And like Mike, I'll do it until the day I stop breathing. Thank you. Oh, that was awesome. Um, thank you, all of you. Um, now, uh, I'm not sure everybody is aware of like every organization, and unfortunately Harry Crouch was supposed to be here and he couldn't make it, he had to get on a flight. Um, but I do want uh, you guys to uh, just say a little bit about your particular organizations. Uh, I'm, I am going to say there's a sign-up sheet for the National Coalition for Men. Uh, Harry Crouch is the president of that, he's, uh, he, but he's not here. Um, but it is in the exhibit room and uh, we'd love people to sign up for that. So. Do that before you forget, uh, before you forget during lunch or something like that. So uh, go ahead, Robert. Okie dokie. My organization is the National Parents Organization. Uh, I can give you a card if you want it. Uh, you can go online and see what we're doing. Uh, we are in an extremely good place right now. We have some money. Uh, we have some talent and uh, we are doing some very good work, um, among other things. <coughs> pardon me. Uh, the, we passed in Kentucky uh, last year the first ever presumption of equal parenting in uh, family court post-divorce. It's been done nowhere else in the world. And other states, legislators from other states, are calling the uh, legislature, legislators in Kentucky saying, hey, what did you do? How did you do that? Stuff like that. We have a lot of optimism about the future. We're also doing um, a child support uh, project. We have funding to analyze uh, every state's uh, child support laws and practices um, and that's going to be coming out in September. Uh, we, we are extremely optimistic about the future. Um, the, the opposition, uh, the feminists have basically disappeared. They, they basically don't show up anymore. Uh, the vote in the Kentucky legislature was unanimous in favor of equal parenting in one house and had two nay votes in the other. And the, yeah, so there is a lot of positive energy out there um, and educating legislature, legislators and judges is the, next, is the next frontier, is getting them the social science and neuroscience on uh, fatherhood and equal parenting. So we are in good shape, go to the, go to the website. So in, in 2012, as a former businessman, I was becoming increasingly enraged at the, um, at the government bullying of major companies into increasing the proportion of women on their boards. 
Um, so I launched something called Campaign for Merit in Business. I mean, these days it's little, little, little more than a website. Um, but, but there was already evidence from longitudinal studies in Norway, Germany, and the US that when you increase the proportion of women on corporate boards, um, financial performance declines on average. There is, there is a very clear causal link. Um, uh, and after 12 months of battering my head against the wall and just getting no engagement with politicians, journalists, or anybody else, I thought, I, 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 can't, I can't carry on with this. Um, so so um, I launched a political party, Justice for Men and Boys, and the women who loved them. Um, and within a week, I was on the BBC radio on a, on, a, on a show with, I think, seven or eight million listeners, Jer Jeremy Vine, um, um, debating with a batshit insane feminist, Laura Bates, or special, sn special snowflake, as we usually refer to her. Um, but it's one of the reasons that, that, that these conferences, I, I try and encourage people. I know it's really difficult in the US. I don't know about Canada. But uh, in the UK, it's so easy to form a political party. It's like 100 pounds and three or four three or four forms. Um, but it, 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 for us, it has been, it's definitely been the key to, um, to, 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 to getting some, you know, some ma mainstream media attention. Um, and I must have appeared, I think, more than probably 150 times on BBC TV and radio, although I'm forever attacking them. <laughs> so it's kind of ironic, but there we are. Um, and in, in, um, in the, 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 the next year I went to, uh, to the, the, first, the first conference in Detroit, um, which is just the most, most astonishing event, I've got to say. And um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what else I can say. Oh, our, our manifesto, I think we were the first people to put into, into one document um, a lot of men's issues and, and sort of, uh, if you like, action points relating to them. The, a lot of people had sort of talked about them, but our, our manifesto, which is a snappy 80 pages long, um, uh, uh, covers 20 areas where the human rights of men and boys in Britain today are assaulted by the state's actions or inactions, almost always to privilege women and girls. And I sometimes have fun at Speaker's Corner with feminists by asking them to name one area where the state assaults their human rights. Not one in the last four or five years has managed to come up with one area. They come up with batshit stupid things like the gender pay gap. But, um, but anyway, I, I've, I've talked enough. Thank you. I founded uh, VoiceForMen.com in the summer of 2009. We're just celebrating our 10th anniversary. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm proud to say, honestly, that with the help of a lot of people there, Voice for Men has become the online flagship uh, for the men's movement uh, in many ways. I'm very proud of the website. We focused our first four or five years on pissing off feminists and we did a magnificent job. <laughs> and we still like to piss off feminists. I mean, we've got to have recreation sometime, right? Um, we also have shifted a lot of our focus onto men's mental health. I talked a moment ago about the unexplored, undiscovered pain of men. And anybody that's ever been to one of these conferences and, and just mingled with the crowd and talked to these guys or listened to their comments, you see when people line up for questions, they usually don't ask questions. Mike is always out there saying, can you please ask a question in this somewhere? These are people that have never been heard in their lives by anybody. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to be heard. It's why we called the website A Voice for Men. Um, and Sorry, unlike uh, Robert's organization, we are not flush with cash, so I want to remind everybody there is a donation button on the site if you care to help us do our work. Um, and let me point out that just because we have some money does not <laughs> absolve you from sending funds. Man, don't step on my pitch. <laughs> anyway, that's enough for me. That's who I am and what I do. I formed Men's Rights Incorporated as, as a nonprofit in 1977, the same year that uh, Free Men was being formed. And my conception of it was that um, I, I needed a corporation to qualify for grants, which I thought were going to be coming in. At the time, I didn't realize that 
all the grant money was controlled by feminists, even, even at the Playboy Foundation. Um, but it's, so I didn't conceive of it as a membership organization the way Freeman was, and, and you know, I, I just saw no competition between the two, and um, just we mutually helped each other. Um, I did a lot of really, s I, get, I was about to say smart moves, but it wasn't smart because I didn't realize why, <laughs> why it, was t it would work out. Like I formed that organization for grants. It was a smart move not because I got grants, but because suddenly I was the um, executive director of, of a corporation, which gave me some credibility. And I, I taught that first course in men's rights um, in order to get, and I knew research had to be done and nobody was, you know, I was, I was busy creating a field and um, I thought, well, now I'll have students. I'll just assign them the research that I wanted done. And they did do projects, but it turned out to be a brilliant move, not because of the research they did, but because now um, I'm, I'm a, a visiting, you know, lecturer at a top university that added to my credit. I, I kept doing these things that added to my credibility without even realizing why I was doing it. Um, and I, I, I did have a knack for the media. So I was doing things that generated publicity. Um, back in 1977, I, I guess it was, I challenged ladies' nights. And, um, you know, I, ga I gave a well-reasoned argument before the, um, Massachusetts, the commission. Um, you know, I, I pointed out how, what would you do about White Wednesdays if, a ban if, if there was a bar in the inner city and it wanted to attract more affluent people, if they had White Wednesday, would that be okay? And, um, and I talked them into it, and the Boston Globe came out with this full-page ad, The Man Who Banned Ladies' Nights, and that led to um, publicity, it led to talk shows. I challenged um, life, the life insurance companies, which were charging men more than women, and I pointed out that it's the flip side, the, their argument that, well, men die before women, so it's going to cost us more, is the flip side of pension um, plans, which say women are going to live longer, so they're going to cost more, but it's illegal to discriminate against women in a pension plan, so therefore it should be illegal. Again, this generated publicity, and, and all of these things, um, like the ladies' nights, it was, wasn't so much to ban ladies' nights, but to give me a platform so that I could talk about initiative and relationships and how that imbalance really hurts men and women. I wasn't that concerned about um, the, the premiums and life insurance. I wanted to address life expectancy, and this gave me a chance. And, and so I got on, on talk shows, and they would put me on for like the last five minutes thinking it was, it was going to be funny, they could make fun of me. And at the end of it, they'd go, wow, this isn't what we expected. Would you come back? Let's just do a whole show on this. And one thing led to another, and soon I was doing 100 talk shows a year. Um, so that's the way I forgot. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess I did it, yeah. I, I guess you answered the question. Um, okay, we can have a few questions. Line up at the mic for your chance to talk to these icons. Pardon me, I have stage fright, sorry. So okay, but come. keep in mind, we only have eight minutes, unless we're gonna go late, and I wouldn't advise that since I'm really hungry and need a drink. Um, so, uh, keep it quick. Okay, as a current writer for A Voice for Men, I constantly try to get other uh, MRAs to not just work hard, but to work smarter because uh, I, I think smart activism is, is, a more, is a generally effective. So I was uh, quite, uh, asking, wondering, do you guys have any ways we can work smarter uh, to get men's activism uh, more popularity? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for your contributions to A Voice for Men. Uh, yeah. That's working smart, um, for sure. Uh, I'm probably not the guy to talk to about smart. Uh, <laughs> So I'm passing the mic. <laughs> Listen, uh, one thing that we've discovered uh, in the area of uh, uh, equality in family courts is that educating judges is where it's at. Because look, you can pass a law, but if the judge has a bias against fa fathers, that judge is going to find a way to express that bias in, in his or her rulings. But 
in Arizona, uh, Dr. William Fabricius conducted a series of seminars on the uh, social science of equal parenting, and lo and behold, those judges have started granting equal parenting even though their law doesn't require it. So, so, so education is extremely, extremely important. My comment is for Mike in his um, assertion about how um, when you appoint women to corporate boards, the profits go down. And I have an explanation for this, I think, and I'm sorry, Fred, if this triggers you, but I think every time that the women uh, start to make a suggestion that could in, you know, invoke huge profits and, and save the company, they're interrupted by the men on the corporate board, and that man-terruption kind of like keeps these corporate boards from thriving. And of course, like the men, they spread their legs wide open and constrict, the women have to constrict themselves with a stiff posture and that stiffens the blood flow to their brains and, and they just can't come up with these great suggestions that would save the company. And so I just thought I would offer that as an explanation. How on earth are you gonna mansplain if you don't manterrupt? <laughs> Hello, gentlemen. My name is Basil Stewart, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Basil. I have been drunk on gynocentrism for too long. <laughs> and um, when you take that into consideration, when I started to get to understand a bit more about the men's rights movement, I realized that I had to work on myself first if I'm going to step up. Yeah because I know that it takes a lot of commitment. You guys have, sh have, have, sh have shown that. Yeah. So now that I have worked on myself, I came here to now see what I can do. So my question to you now is, what can I do to be, um, to, to be an effective, smart, men's rights advocate? Because just as my earlier colleague mentioned, we have to be very smart about this because we're dealing with an overwhelming force with very few small resources. So my question to you, the panel, is how can we proceed in a more intelligent, strategic, and effective way so that um, we can manage the overwhelming risk that we have to encounter? I think my, my, my suggestion would be to get involved in the intactivist movement. The rest of the world looks on the United States with absolute disbelief in this area. Mm -hmm. And organizations or people like Brother K and the Bloodstained Men mm -hmm. are doing just great jobs. And you know, they're, they're, they're promoting the film American Circumcision, which is an outstanding mm -hmm. piece of work. <clears throat> and once people understand MGM, then it kind of wakes their eyes to this is one of 20, 20 yeah. plus areas. Um, and they, I don't know if you know the Bloodstained Men, but they kind of wear white overalls with red patches, you know, in mm -hmm. the groin. And, I, I, you know, I'd like to see some, some men um, outside every damned hospital in the U.S. and Canada that carries out this butchery. Okay. Thank you. Hi, my name is Roy. So I went through a recent... Uh, uh, divorce, and one of the major things, uh, two and a half years of litigation on child custody of fight, right? So which was unfair to me. And the, my question to you is basically, as fathers who are going through similar situation, uh, what is the right way to find a lawyer or an attorney who is understanding of main sh issues and child custody situations, who is sympathetic with that? And also, as an individual, how can I contribute to spread more awareness on these issues and, and maybe you know, speak to uh, legislators or you know, what is the right advice you would give me to kind of highlight these issues, father's issues? How to find a lawyer? Don't have a clue. I mean, it's, it's uh, as far as I can tell, it's luck of the draw. Mm. Uh, some of them are highly aware of the issues and will work hard for you. Some of them will take your money just to take your money. And yeah. I'm sorry, I wish I could give you a better answer, but I can't. Um, as far as working for, um, for uh, the rights uh, or for equality in family courts, um, 
Do you live in the United States? Yeah, I live in Virginia, the state Very of good. Virginia. And the Very experience good. I had was my lawyer was super passive. You know, I mean, she just exchanged documents back and forth. She didn't stand up for me. I understand. Um, as far as promoting uh, the, the, the equality in family court, um, the National Parent Organization has an excellent Virginia affiliate. We have we have 20 affiliates. Go online. You can you, you can connect with them. We need we need good help anytime we can get it. Sure, I will join. Very good. Thank Outstanding. I, we have time for just one more. I'm Very sorry if, for everybody who didn't have a chance. I'm sorry. My question is to Mike. Um, uh, you said that not anybody very few people do something positive i tried to join the man's uh, it's called man's Fur in sweden uh to be a listener for men's uh, hotline for men and i went to two interviews but unfortunately i told them that i was very interested i had attended two icmi conferences and i thought this was important they told me Two things. Number one, we are a bipartisan uh, organization, so we're not interested in you. And number two, the, the, there's a controversial figure in one of the men's organizations in Sweden, so, uh, and we don't like him, so I'm sorry, but we can't, uh, you're not welcome here. You are welcome to a, d a discussion. Um, uh, which I went to and I found out that one of the men there, many of them were, were wonderful guys, but one of them was a really brainwashed feminist. So I'm, I gave up. And now, after this, I realized perhaps there is something I could do. Any, any suggestions? You know what I Later think, on. <laughs> you know what I think somebody should do, and this is about working smart? is, well, we had somebody say, how do you find a, a father-friendly divorce lawyer? Why don't, why don't we have somebody put together a database online for that? You're they're doing trying. it? They're oh, trying. there we go. Outstanding. So, they're trying, so that's my first step. All right, you know, you know uh, what? So, I mean, that's just one suggestion. I know you're not probably... Uh, I've got one more quick one for... Go to the ncfm.org website. The National Coalition for Men is always looking to expand chapters in different areas. If, if there isn't one in your area, you can become that chapter and help with the activism. That goes for anybody in here. If you want to help, sign up with the ncfm.org. Even in Sweden? Yeah, uh, even in, even in even another in country. Sweden. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Join. Damn it. All right. Perfect. Perfect. Also, uh, we got to wrap it up now. Give it a wait. Hold your hold your applause. Applause for a minute while I get this. Uh, also, T-shirts for VIPs and ICMI veterans. VIP attendees and ICMI veterans. Um, up at the front, ask at the registration desk, and also speakers uh, are supposed to get together for a group picture. Uh, I'm guessing assemble, yeah, now I believe so. 10 minutes, 10 minutes, so I get, I get to pee and have a smoke and maybe start drinking, so. Yes, at the same time. People of penis, unite.